This video will kick off our respiratory block and our main organ of respiration is our lungs. We take a deep breath in, all the oxygen goes into our lungs, goes into our blood, and then we take a deep breath out. We breathe out waste products like CO2. Yeah, how does it do that? Well, when you take a deep breath in, air will go into your windpipe, your trachea, and your trachea will bifurcate, will bifurcate into your right and your left lungs. And your right and your left lungs are not the same. They're not the same. Your right lung has three lobes. It is larger. Yeah, and it has three lobes because it has a split in it. And it has this horizontal fissure called the horizontal fissure. It has this oblique fissure called the oblique fissure. And that splits into three lobes. One, two, three. Your left lung is a little bit more wonky. Yeah, it's a little bit like misshapen. It has this cavity in the middle. It only has two lobes. Why is it so different? Because your heart is there. Yeah, it has a form, kind of like form around your heart. It has this little projection called the lingula. Uh, lingula means tongue. It has this little tongue-like projection, and this is called the lingula, and it is basically the analog of the right middle lobe. But it doesn't really count as a lobe, so in total, the left lobe only has Two lobes, yeah. You, something else you should know when you breathe in, when you breathe in, it's kind of silky smooth. Yeah, you're not feeling your lungs great against your, your chest wall. That'd be terrible. And you're thinking, why? I mean, I have bones there, I have muscles there, I have ribs there, why don't I feel that great? Well, because your lungs are surrounded by something like a saran wrap. It has this pleura called the visceral pleura. Visceral pleura. And here's your chest wall. Here's your chest wall. And attached to your chest wall, you have another pleura called the parietal pleura. And in between these two pleuras is this cavity called the pleural cavity. And we have fluid here, pleural fluid. And by having fluid in between, we can kind of lubricate our lungs. Every time we take a deep breath in, it expands. Who has that lubrication? Take a deep breath out. It, kind of shrinks, so we can breathe breathe kind of easy, kind of smoothly. Some, uh, I guess some nomenclature, some nomenclature, you know, visceral means internal organs, that's why this pleural is attached to your internal organ, your lung. Uh, parietal means attached to a wall, that's why it's attached to your chest wall. And your parietal pleura has sharp pain receptors, so it can sense sharp pain, sharp pain. I had a Question asked where someone took a deep breath in and they felt sharp, sharp pain because they had like pleuritis or whatever. And then they asked what pleural was causing this pain. It's your parietal pleura. It has that, those pain receptors, okay? That's just something you should be aware of. Now, something else you should be aware of. Know that your, I drew this for a reason. Your trachea bifurcates and when it bifurcates to your right lung, it's a little bit more vertical. When it bifurcates to your left lung, it's a little bit more, I guess, 90 degree-ish. And it's important because sometimes you can aspirate something you don't want. Sometimes you might inhale like a peanut. Yeah, and that peanut goes into your windpipe. And can you guess where it wants to go? Will it go take a 90 degree turn? No, it'll just drop straight in. So a lot of times when you aspirate something, it goes into your right lung. And usually it drops all the way down to your lower lung your lower lobe. Okay, and when you're sitting up, when you're standing up and you aspirate something, so right, upright, it usually goes to the back bottom part of your right lower lobe. Fancy way of saying that is posterior basal. So the back bottom portion of your right lower lobe, right lower lobe. If you're lying down and you, I don't know, you're eating like peanuts, like, <laughs> and you aspirate something, it'll go to your lower lobe, but since you're kind of lying down, it'll, I guess, be a little higher. So, all right, supine, it goes to your superior segment of your right lower lobe. That's what it looks like grossly. That's what your lungs look like grossly. It's like, if you open your chest, that's what your lungs look like. But Deep down, it gets a little bit more complicated. So let's take, a, let's take a moment to look at your lung anatomy in a little more detail. Deep down, it gets way more complicated. So we said air went to our trachea, our trachea, and that bifurcated into our right and left lung. And these branches we call our bronchi. 
And what do you think they do? They also start to divide. They divide into secondary and tertiary, tertiary bronchi. And these bronchi will also divide. Uh, we sometimes call it this bronchial tree because it looks like a tree in your lungs because of all these division. And these will eventually become bronchioles. Bronchioles. And if we look closely, we look closely, your bronchioles will eventually lead to the functional unit of our lungs called alveoli. These are little sacs that help us exchange oxygen. So it'll eventually lead to these little sacs. So I'll just try and magnify the last portion, all right? Your bronchioles will become this special type of bronchial, this special type of bronchial. So all right, special bronchial. So it becomes a special type of bronchial and that special type of bronchial will lead to your alveolar sac, which are full of alveoli, full of alveoli. And it is your alveoli that comes in contact with your blood. And when you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen and that oxygen goes into your blood. And when you breathe out, you breathe out all that waste product, all that CO2. CO2, which comes from your blood, it goes into your lungs and you breathe out with each breath. So alveoli are our functional unit of our lungs. Now what makes this bronchial special? Why is this more special than your regular bronchioles? Well, this bronchial has little alveoli on the wall. So this we call our respiratory bronchioles. All right, so your bronchioles will eventually branch into your respiratory bronchioles, which will eventually become your alveolar sac. The only portions of your lungs that can partake in gas exchange is things that have alveoli. That's the things that can exchange gas, right? So this is going to be called your respiratory zone. This is a zone that can exchange gas, respiratory zone. That will mean by default, everything else doesn't exchange gas, doesn't partake in respiration. Doesn't partake in respiration. It still has its function, right? It still directs and conducts air into our alveoli. So this we call the conducting zone. Conducting zone. A probably more rude term for it is called anatomical dead space. It doesn't do anything, it's kind of dead, which is kind of mean, but that's what we call it. So we call it dead space. But it's, like I said, it still has its function. It still conducts air, conducts air, directs air, humidifies air. So when you're out in the cold and you're breathing and you're not breathing in like 20 degree air and just, ah, that's so cold. No, it warms and humidifies air. All right, warms air. Probably one of the most important things it is it helps filter air. It helps filter out all the crap in the air. And does this because it has things like goblet cells, which release mucus and that mucus kind of traps particles it has things like cilia cilia and together they form the muco ciliary elevator all right so mucus traps gunk that's the mucus part and then your ciliary ciliary your cilia basically like beats it upwards, beats it upwards. That's why it's called the elevator. So it beats up all this gunk upwards, 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 up into your windpipe until you feel a little tickle in your throat and you <coughs> cough that gunk out. And it can be particles, it can be like food, it can be anything. So it's very important in protecting, conducting air, all this stuff. It just doesn't take part in respiration. Well, how could it? It doesn't have alveoli. So we call this our conducting zone. Something important you should know, now your cilia aren't found in your alveoli, yeah, they kind of go away and you, you're wondering like, oh no, what if crap goes into our alveoli, how are we going to get it out? We have macrophages for that, macrophages. All right, so we have it covered, <laughs> don't worry. Now something, that, something else they want you to know is the epithelium of your respiratory tract, the epithelium of your respiratory tract. Your conducting zone has all that cilia, right? has that protective cilia. And so your conducting zone is gonna be pseudo stratified 
ciliated columnar. As we move down, as we move down, we said you kind of lose your cilia. As we move down, we also said you will eventually make your alveoli. And your alveoli has to exchange gas, and it has to be really, really thin to do that. So we're not going to be having cilia. We're not going to have columnar, because columnar is, I guess, thicker. We're going to have to lose that cilia. We're going to have to thin out our membrane. So when it gets to your respiratory bronchioles, it becomes cuboidal. And finally, when it gets to your alveoli, it goes full, flat out squamous. As flat as you can get. As flat as you can get so you can exchange that gas. All right, they always like to ask histo for some reason. Uh, that's like the bane of med students' existence, but histo for uh, lungs aren't that bad. The epithelium of your conducting zone all the way down to your bronchioles, your terminal bronchioles, will be your stratified ciliated columnar. And then once you go down to your respiratory bronchioles, you have cuboidal. And then once you go down to your alveoli, you'll have squamous because you need that gas exchange. Okay. Now switching topics, your lungs are kind of cool in that uh, portions of your lungs work independently of each other. It's not just one giant lung. Yeah, they work independently of each other. In fact, your lobes are independent of each other. And even within your lobes, even segments within your lobes are independent of each other. So you can surgically remove a segment of your lobe of your right upper lobe and it will have no effect on your right middle lobe or your right lower lobe. They're all independent of each other. It's kind of like an apartment complex. Yeah, each apartment complex has its own like running water, electricity, living person. Yeah, and if that goes out and no one's renting that, it doesn't affect the other apartments, right? And so your lungs are kind of unique in that way. You can take out segments and it won't affect any other segments. These segments are independent. We call these bronchopulmonary segments. Bronco pulmonary segments. They have their own blood supply. They have their own nervous supply. They have their own lymphatic supply. They're completely independent. Completely independent. So let's just talk about the blood supply. Your lungs function as respiration, right? Take in oxygen, oxygenate things, and then release CO2. And one of the things that needs to oxygenate is our blood. And so our heart pumps blood to our lungs and gets it oxygenated. So our pulmonary artery pumps deoxygenated blood to our lungs. It gets oxygenated, returns to our heart via the pulmonary vein. Now your lungs also need its own blood supply to support it. So your cells don't die, so your lung doesn't die. And so its own blood supply is from our bronchial artery and our veins. Artery and our veins. And then we said it has a lymphatic supply, and we said it had a nervous supply. So every segment has branches of your pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein, bronchial artery, bronchial vein, lymphatics, and nerve supply, okay? So just, just keep that locked in the back of your mind that your lungs have independent segments that kind of work together, but even if you take one out, they can still function on their own, okay? Let's move on to some embryology. How did we form all this stuff in the first place? Let me erase, let me try and clear the board. This is kind of messy. So how do we form all of this in the first place? Well, lung embryology starts in week four. Starts in week four. And from your foregut, from your esophagus, all right, esophagus, you have a little bud that comes out. And that bud will eventually become your trachea and it will separate, all right? So the first phase in lung embryology is called the embryonic phase. The embryonic phase. And the embryonic phase forms the trachea all the way down to the tertiary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. So like right here. So I write trachea to tertiary bronchi. What do you think can go wrong here? Well, these things cannot separate and you get a trachea esophagus fistula, tracheal esophageal fistula, TE fistula. 
So I write T fistulas. You can have abnormal branching and budding, and you can form cysts where these bronchi actually become kind of enlarged, dilated, just abnormal. So you can have bronchiogenic cysts. But if everything goes to plan, we move on to our second stage, our second stage, which is called pseudoglandular. Pseudoglandular. And here, our tertiary bronchi will start to branch, and what do they make? They make your bronchioles, don't they? And so this goes all the way down to your terminal bronchioles. You'll start to make capillaries, but you can't partake in respiration yet. Why can't you partake in respiration? Have you made your alveoli? No, so you can't partake in respiration. But if everything goes well, you will move on to our third stage, which is called canicular stage. And here you go from your terminal bronchioles. What do you make next? You make your special respiratory bronchioles, don't you? You make your respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchial. And your respiratory bronchioles are special because they have little bits of alveoli on them. And so respiration is possible. It is possible. But we still want to form our alveolar sacs. All right, rest is possible. It is possible, but isn't the main way we do it. But everything. We, but if everything works out, then we move on to our next stage. Our next stage is called saccular. What do you think that means? We start to form a primitive, primitive alveolar sac. A primitive alveolar sac. So instead of a bunch of alveoli, we probably have a few. It forms these primitive first separations. So I write sac plus primary septate to start kind of separating our, our alveoli. This is also when cells can come in and develop our lungs called pneumocytes. We're going to talk about that in our next video. So pneumocytes come in. And our last stage, our last stage is finally going to be the alveolar stage. Alveolar stage. We start to form more separations. And this divides up the alveolar even more. And now we, now we have tons of alveolar, kind of like we do in adulthood. So this forms our secondary separations, septates, and further divides and makes more alveoli. And you, and an important thing to know is when you're born, you have a ton of alveoli, but they continue to increase in number as you grow all the way until you're like eight, all the way until you're like a, a kid, right? So I'll just write keeps growing, keeps growing. And that is lung anatomy, just basic lung anatomy. That is embryology. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.